Welcome to the Marvel Cinematic University Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Canton III, and we're continuing our coverage of the Disney Plus Star Wars series, The Acolyte, Episode 7, Choice. And let me tell you, you've got to make a choice to subscribe to the MC University Patreon. Patreon.com slash MC University Pod. You can get our bonus content, such as the Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning episode that we recorded yesterday is out today. For subscribers, it was a lot of fun. Shout uh-huh. out to Rod and Teach for joining us. And to get that and get into our Discord in every previous episode, $3. And appreciate everybody for supporting in the meantime. And also, of course, as you see these wonderful faces right now on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, like, comment, subscribe, all of those things. And appreciate everybody for supporting as well. So, let's introduce the panel first, the super producer, Jake Christie. Jake, how are you? I'm hot as hell, and I won't take it anymore. No, it's, uh, I have to, <laughs> my air conditioning's too loud. Um, this is, this is the, I talked about this on the Mission Impossible pod. I, I, I was complaining about it to the point, guys, where Rod uh, DM'd me a link for a fan on Amazon. So, uh, <laughs> salute to Rod. Yeah, Appre- salute, salute to Rod. But yeah, I'm doing well other than that. Yes, wonderful. And we have two guests with us to get to, to this penultimate episode first. One of our favorite nerdalists, friend of the show, Leah Marilla Thomas. Leah, how you doing? Doing all right. I'm I'm have my air conditioning on in the other room, so oh. hopefully it won't be too loud and I won't melt. No, yeah, it, it's not too loud. The problem with me is that the air conditioning in the living room is on the opposite side, of the, so it'd be like spitting in the wind. So I just got to grit and bear it. Ah, wonderful stuff. And we all, we do have a first time guest, first timer on the show. His name is Mark Schindler. He covers the WNBA, does a great job of it, by the way. You can check out his YouTube channel and also the They've Got Now podcast. Mark, welcome to the program. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. I'm, I'm super stoked to be on. I appreciate you guys having me. Um, to, to continue the AC theme, mm-hmm. uh, I have the AC on in this room uh, only because I'm at my girlfriend's house. Absolutely love her, love her family. They keep the house at like 79 degrees oh. so i get like little allotted periods where i'm allowed to actually have the ac on and uh that is right now that's so, that's my mom my mom is a yeah. 78 degree i grew up in florida and my mom is a 78 degrees person um Good Lord. now yeah and the, the problem ultimately is that you're fine because you have central air but new york city is still in the 1960s and everyone has window units so <laughs> that sounds terrible yeah. Yeah. it's not great not great at all but yes the acolyte episode seven and we've been waiting to find out what soul and all those Jedi were hiding uh, uh, on the planet of Brendok. And goodness gracious, we found out that the Jedi are some no good sons of guns, let me tell you. So before we do any of that, as customary when we have people on the show who have not been on, we want to get their initial thoughts on what the show, the series has been to this point. Mark, I'll start with you. What have you thought about the Acolyte to this point coming into this episode? Yeah, it's so funny because uh, initially when it started, I didn't start right away because I was worried. I've just been like, you guys have touched on it a lot in past episodes. And um, I am like, I I really appreciate a lot of what Dave Filoni has done for the Star Wars universe, but I'm like so amped to have a show that is not part of the Filoni-verse. Like we just have a show that is its own show. And I think that's what's made it so much fun to to tap into and enjoy like we just have a new story it's not tied into everything else i don't have to have seen 16 other things to know what's going on in the backstory and um i think that so much of what's like made that exciting for me is i just i feel like i get to learn a lot of new stuff every episode Mm -hmm. particularly in this one yeah um i also want to hit on too i was overly harsh of the lightsaber stuff initially mm-hmm. um i thought the first episode like the first five minutes I was like you gotta be joking like this is not what the lightsaber stuff is gonna be like mm-hmm. i think episode seven of the acolyte was like some of the best lightsaber work we've mm-hmm. gotten in the last 20 years of star wars yeah that was incredible uh ahsoka please take notes uh because no <laughs> um but yeah i uh i i'm i'm really enjoying it so far and i also love particularly a lot of the themes that we're getting out of this even if they're a little bit more like rudimentary i think part of what's so fun of them being sweeping is that you can really just think a lot about it mm-hmm. um and especially with what we're seeing between our, our protagonists like i feel like we have so much to just kind of chew on and think about each week in uh particularly in this one that we most certainly do and leah how about you what have you thought of this show coming into this episode i think i've liked it more and more with each week mm-hmm. i think at the beginning 
um, I was like very enthusiastic, was placing it sort of below Andor and then between some seasons of The Mandalorian, which I feel like, and now it's creeping up above a little bit. Um, yeah, I had another thought. What was I going to say? It's, it's fascinating. It's so smart. It's so much smarter than I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be because it's, it's a different type of intelligence, right? Um, and yeah, I like how it is. I feel like we say, we use, we repeat that. Um, it's like poetry. It rhymes mm-hmm. lines so much to the point where it's kind of a joke. And this is doing that rhyming in mm-hmm. really creative, interesting ways and like making Star Wars familiar and different. Um, mm-hmm. Those are my general thoughts. Yeah. You know, the, the interesting thing that you mentioned about intelligence and a different type of intelligence, I feel like this episode illustrates the emotional intelligence or a lack thereof yeah. mm-hmm. of the Jedi, um, particularly soul. And let's start there because what we find out is that soul seems to be incredibly focused on having a Padawan to mm-hmm. the point that Indara chastises him for it throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. And because of soul's insistence on saving the girls and kind of pushing and being incredibly aggressive, incredibly emotional, Mm -hmm. things that you don't associate with a Jedi. A lot of the things that ensue, there's a bunch of tragedy. Like, yes, May was the one who did start the fire that, Mm -hmm. that she couldn't control after the fact, even though she did, she was trying to attempt to put it out, but souls really the chief instigator Mm -hmm. of everything that occurred in this episode. And, and, I want to go around the room and get everybody's perspective on what we saw from him, because I think throughout this season so far, I've been a, such a proponent of this is an interesting character. This is an empathetic yeah. character that mm-hmm. you feel for. You feel sorry mm-hmm. for in a way, because it seems like he's carrying so much guilt. And you're like, why is he carrying so much guilt? And then you watch this and I'm like, this guy's a dickhead. Like what? Like, come on, man. How could you do this? So, I yes. don't wanna, I don't. Oh. I I think I have a more nuanced view on him. Not that I yes. don't think he made big wrong decisions, but I oh, actually terrible. think I actually mm-hmm. think calling him a dickhead is I think understating the the fact that the that the decisions he made mm-hmm. are sort of inevitable with the way the Jedi are set up. That if Jedi are to believe that they're the only arbiters of the Force and the only people who can properly use the Force, it mm-hmm. actually is the logical conclusion that he needs to save children if they're being indoctrinated by witches. Like, the thing that they can't reconcile is, like, it's the thing I've been talking about this whole time, is that they're simultaneously a religious organization, but also peacekeepers. And so, like, he's not wrong. If your belief is that the only responsible way to use the Force is to be a Jedi, those children need to be saved. That is the correct... And obviously, we know that that's not right. But, like, right. I think... And obviously, he's emotional. He wants Osho to be his Padawan, and that's a lot of the animating force of it. But I think that he makes a really terrible decision. But there is no real, like, framework of what to do about these people. That, like, the decision... Because even if he didn't make the decision to try to save Osha, they are going to, what, consult with the council and probably destroy these people anyway. Like... The fact that they don't know what to do with people who use the Force that are not Jedi is the right. root of this whole problem. And, like, yeah, Soul made some really horrible decisions. But, at this, but you know, so I don't think any of the Jedi in this episode would would handle these... Like, they none of them want to leave these witches alone, you know? Like, I, I think that that's kind of... Once again, I think he's... I want to be clear. I think he was being very selfish and shitty. Um, but, yeah, I just think that people are selfish and shitty. And if your yeah, institution that's... can't account for that, then like, yeah, that's a tough, yeah, that's a tough, uh, road to, to follow with that. Um, Leah, what did you think of soul in this episode? Did it change your view of him in any particular way? Just overall? Definitely. I was also sort of like, I'm rooting for you. I want you yeah. to be, we like, were all rooting for you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what struck me a lot is so I think I think we knew that this episode was going to be a flashback, or that we would get another flashback from a from a different point of view. Um, and I think I and maybe other people assumed that this was going to be from May's point of view, and instead it's from the Jedi's point of view, which is that kind of thing where you're like, oh, it makes sense now that I'm thinking about it. Um, 
so you we see soul see soul um witness the scenes from um destiny that we've seen before yeah. right and he's catching sort of like the tail end of them and they look a little bit sinister and it's like okay i can kind of see why he's thinking these things but he's still making passing judgments he's so judgmental of this culture that he doesn't understand immediately and thinks he knows better and thinks that these kids are in danger thinks they're not being treated like children which is a very interesting thing to say for two reasons (laughs) the first being he was taken when he was four years old so he doesn't really know Mm -hmm. what a childhood is like the second if we think back to what happened with jackie Mm -hmm. and what chimere said to him when he when he kills her and Sol says she was a child and Chimera says, but you brought her mm. here. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's very, it's very deliciously complex. I think. Mm. Interesting stuff. And and Mark, how about you? What did you feel about Sol and his choices, his decision-making, everything that occurred with him in this episode? Yeah. I think part of what was so fun about this is like, even like episode six is where, you know, they really start to sow the seeds of doubt in him as a character a little bit. Um, And I think especially with this episode, uh, kind of like what Leah and Jake are both alluding to, like, I think that so much of this is um, the power of perspective, Mm -hmm. Um, because, again, like in that that episode, the the initial flashback of of May and Osha from Osha's perspective, you think that like clearly like we we had an assumption Mm -hmm. that there was something more going on. But like everything makes it look like, oh, May just like killed everybody. But it's like very clear. No, she was just trying to set like the Jedi invitation on fire and you know, she's a kid, so she doesn't know how to control it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think exactly like Leah's hitting on with talking about soul, part of what's so difficult about the Jedi that I think you don't think mm-hmm. about growing up, what you do now is like, it's an ultimatum to be a yeah. Jedi. Like yeah. there is no other way of life. Yeah. There is no other acceptance. Like the Jedi get viewed as good because you're looking at them through the lens of mm-hmm. Jedi or people in the Republic. And very much so like, I, I like exactly like i think from soul's perspective you can understand like oh hearing all this stuff about ascension yeah. and you know may totally mischaracterizes what the ascension is supposed to be at least in my opinion um like they just make it out to the, everything looks evil because it's not what you yeah. do and everything looks bad because it's not what you you had or, or you believe and it just shows like it's so frustrating because they create all of their own problems mm-hmm. because of how they view the world and how they interact with it Like, because, well, our only way of interacting with something is pretending it doesn't exist Mm -hmm. or eradicating Mm -hmm. it and taking the youth away. Like, how are you supposed to have, quote unquote, balance in the force when there's no balance in the way that you approach anything? And uh, I think that's what made this such a compelling episode to me, because I think this is like one of the, I mean, one of the ultimate ways that we've ever been shown, like the Jedi are truly evil in a lot of ways that you don't necessarily always get to see. Um, And I think, yeah, this this show, this especially, and like not to to move it too far forward, but like I think part of what I loved most about this episode is how they almost used Torben as a Padawan, as a mirror Mm -hmm. for for what Osha would go through eventually in the Jedi Order and reflecting on why it's so difficult to be this order built on ideology and not just ideology, but like strict Mm -hmm. adherent ideology um, because – he's a kid and he wants to go back home. And like, that's totally understandable. And he starts this whole ordeal by going off on the speeder. Obviously, I mean, you could say soul does, but like, I think, you know, Mm -hmm. it gets escalated. Um, But then, you know, then that feeds into this whole thing of, well, you know, technically Indara, even though she didn't want this stuff to happen, does a low key little genocide trying to, to get, Kalnaka Mm -hmm. out. And then she's like, well, we don't want to ruin this kid's dream. And I'm like, no, that's not how that works. Like, I get that, but also you can't do this and then be like, well, we're just going to keep doing our way. But that's, I mean, that's the fucked up. I mean, that's like the whole thing. And like, I, you know, at the risk of comparing it too much to the real world, like it's like all of the problems with religions in the real world is not just the people believing stuff. It's whenever they also are an institution that needs to enforce stuff. Like, and, and and like the thing I was thinking about, honestly, when I was watching the episode is it's like a, a thing that I have often wondered and I've had conversations with people in my life who are very religious where it's like, if you are someone who is deeply religious and genuinely believes that everyone is not who is not given their life to like Jesus Christ is going to hell, it is actually rational to want to indoctrinate other kids. Like if you actually believe that, like you, and I think that that's what kind of they're thinking. It's like, yeah, 
what well, either these kids are gonna like you know be forced into being slaves is what they think or we save them and it's like you can't you can think that but then you're also not allowed to be the cops of the galaxy you can't do both of those things because then you have the end where anara is like we're gonna cover this all up and it's like well shit that's that's not the religion talking that's the institution talking Yep. And this is what I wanted from The Mandalorian so bad. I was like, oh, finally this show is going to tell us once and for all that space religion is bad. And instead they've doubled oh, it. That honestly was my least it. favorite thing about The Mandalorian where it's like, this person lives by a code that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And other people seem to be having more fulfilling lives because they don't fully live by it. And the moral of the story is, it's correct. You should keep his helmet on. <laughs> 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 That's Petter, we actually don't need you to come into work. That's great. <laughs> you stay home, and he's like, "Thanks, let's oh, do man. it." That's that. That's great stuff. No, I I think the points made are all well and astute, and you know, as far as as far as uh, Torben is concerned, and this is really a horrifying episode for him. It really puts into light why he decides to to commit suicide. At the same time, though, Jodie Turner-Smith essentially whispering my ear is not exactly horrifying. I'm sorry. Like, it's... And also, she's just being like, work sucks, am I right? And he's like, "Uh uh-huh, I'm gonna kidnap a child. I'm kidding, but also, when I'm watching it, I'm like, this doesn't seem so bad. There are worse people to haunt my dreams. No, but I think the wild part is, I don't even know if they were really haunting him, per se. It felt like, to me, they were letting him know, hey, the folks that you're with are not exactly above board. One, Indara doesn't tell him what they're on the planet for at first. So he got to find that out on his own. So obviously once he finds that out on his own, then he's kind of running off the handle, already emotional because he wants to go home and all of those things. And that whole, like, I'm not going to tell you because it's a part of some greater lesson type of thing is just not a way to do things generally. And... Again, this plays into the religion and the ideology of things and how that just doesn't work and how you can create an uprising the other way. I, and this is what I've what I've loved about this series is because Andor, you see the rebellion, the uprising and the empire are just fat cats and they're just chilling and everything's cool. And that's why the rebellion comes because they don't see it coming. And the Jedi just want to control things so much one up, and it's always the the famous saying is the more that you grip uh, and hold on to something, the easier it is for it for you to let go. And mm-hmm. this is what we see, uh, what we see with Osha, uh, what we've seen with May, who feels incredibly her her plot of vengeance feels incredibly justified now. Um, mm-hmm. And so having all of these things put into light is really cool because you get to see. Not just that the Jedi are are terrible, but also they're dumb too. Like these are just some really rudimentary, unrealistic ways to talk to people and deal with people. Because I, I think just overall, it's again, like I said back at the point of the start of the episode, the lack of emotional intelligence from everybody in this episode really played out in such a horrifying way for for all parties involved and then on top of that we gonna do the cover-up so then the cover-up which always is worse than the crime Mm -hmm. and as we see over the years it plays out to the point where we are now um i want to talk about mark mentioned earlier about the lightsaber uh battle that we saw with uh kelnaka torben and soul which was a lot of fun and it was funny for me, like to see Soul get gun shy because he he kills Anasea, which again another terrible mistake from Soul because he thinks he thinks May is Osha and he thinks that Anasea is about to do something uh, terrible to her and and then that choice was a terrible choice. But then of course Kelnaka gets taken over and this is one of the more like I know Jake had mentioned at the start of the series we want to see the Wookiee get busy. It was fun to see the Wookiee finally get busy. Yeah, it was great. And I will say, the thing I loved about, you know, Soul, you know, being rash and, you know, murdering her is that, like, I think it's, it is another great, you know, moral lesson. And I know, like Mark said, that this is very broad, like, big themes. But, like, this is Star Wars. This is not, you know, a costume drama. Like, this is broad themes that, like, 
you find that even what if someone is well-meaning, but they assume that other people all have awful intentions, that allows them to justify doing horrible things. That he thinks that this woman is capable of murdering her own child. Even though there's really no evidence of that, but he just thinks that anyone who's not in his way of thinking is capable of that. And so, like, while Sil personally might have, you know, be a good person or whatever, that there's, and this is the thing I find in real people in my daily life that it frustrates me, it's like, there's actually a limit to how good of a person you can be if you immediately assume most people have evil intentions. And him assuming that she has evil intentions is what caused this whole thing. If they just had a fucking conversation, she was going to let her go. <laughs> like, but he can't get out of his own way of assuming that everyone who's not wearing the robe is, you know, trying to corrupt children. AC, you are muted for the first time. It's usually me doing that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, no, Mark, you were, you were talking about earlier how you, you thought this was some of the best lightsaber work that you've seen in Star Wars in a long time. Uh, can you speak to that more of what you saw between Kelnaka, Torbin, and Sol? Yeah, part of what is so fun about it is like, I feel like just in general, especially in the, the later live action stuff we've gotten, a lot of it just looks so like, obviously there's choreography in it. Like that goes without saying, but, um, this just felt like every and and like i mean we go back what is that two episodes now too when we got the the giant duel between kamir and um and and the jedi slaughterhouse um you you know like you every single fighter has like their own Mm. style that seems to mirror who they are as individuals and i love that i think to me that's part of what makes it so exciting like it actually looks almost like real sword play um and that's why i like it because i think so much of it is of of the force and being a jedi is like it is individualistic and it's about who you are and how you kind of embody things because even though again like everything is very much uh like supposed to be straight and narrow that's the whole point that's why we have star wars as a thing because if if the jedi were actually what the jedi thought we were there wouldn't be a story um (laughs) but exactly because like we're talking about with soul like so much of like even indara telling him multiple times you know you're being too emotional you're too much in your feelings and like soul very clearly thinks he isn't but like everything that happens because of the Jedi and this is rooted in fear. Like they kill people because they're afraid of another way of life or that it could be different from what they do or that it could be evil. And I mean, yeah, obviously we're talking about lightsaber play, but again, like it all feeds back into that. And like, especially like Cal Naka, like he's out there Mm -hmm. like swinging like Aaron Uh Judge and uh, (laughs) looks like Jose Altuve standing next to him. So it's like, you know, there's just so much, that goes in back and forth. It's very fun in that, and um, and I appreciate oh, it very it was much. A lot, it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Torben was just getting his ass whooped. We see why he has a scar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's just a very traumatic experience for this person. And and Leah, what did you think of the whole ordeal? I mean, even you could talk about the impact to Torben, but just a a, a hypnotized Kelnaka just going after them folks was just was just kind of crazy to see. Yeah, I loved it. It does kind of make him the least guilty uh-huh. in this crew. Yeah. Yeah, he was just bit. freaking making food, getting his cooking so, insulted. Yeah. He was out here. Um, yeah, yeah, I love how the witches said, we do not need to fight. We will make you fight each other. Uh, that rolled. That was great. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been reaped that one jump. Mm-hmm. Move. Oh yeah, he, he, yeah. He's got some athleticism. Moment. Like he's really like yeah. He's, he's really going he around. And happy, happy for that guy. Yeah, maybe Jesus. Finland. Because he's been playing maybe Wookiees Finland would be in the Olympics for basketball though if he wasn't freaking dressing up as a Wookie. I'm kidding. He was like a fringe starter <laughs> in college. He's not, but still. <laughs> yeah, I I think that was a that was a really fun scene. That was a really fun scene to see overall, and. I wanted to also hit in Indara because, I mean, from the outset of this series, when May kills her, it's like, damn, that happened quick. Where where we go from here? So we got a little piece of the flashback in episode three, and I feel like this episode puts her more into focus as the real leader of these folks. And yeah. she was making a lot of good points throughout the episode and i was with her all the way till we got to the end mm-hmm. so jake yeah. what what did you think of what did you think of what we got to see from indara her personality and kind of how her leadership worked in a lot of ways and in some ways did it i think that she was saying all the right things and generally making the right decisions like in the face of different uh you know 
other people making points. But I think that there were a couple things that were staring her in the face that I think specifically her not taking seriously Tormund's issues, Mm -hmm. I think is like really like that and not like she acknowledges what soul is doing in regards to osha but like isn't actually willing to confront it head on and like i think that this goes back to like especially with the torment thing where it's like if you make the rule basically that you as a group are not going to act upon emotion then you don't come up with a framework for how to deal with people who are dealing with emotions and so like she doesn't really the only response to torment being homesick and wanting to go home is to downplay it because she can't take it seriously because it's you don't they don't deal with emotions and so like I said she does a lot. She says a lot of the right things. She's like, "Oh yeah, you know that makes sense. That we should go. You know, let's try to de-escalate like this." But like, you know, she she's pro- like definitely not as much to blame as Solo Tormund, but she is also not hesitant to rock and roll at the drop of a hat. If I make quote heat once uh, <laughs> once things start going down, it's like she is the one who kills most the most people. So it's like it's hard for me to fully yeah. you know, give her a break. I think, you know, it's funny. In retrospect now, you could kind of see why she didn't want Osha to be a Jedi and why she was the one who said. Because that was one of the questions that I have. Why did she not want Osha to be a part of the Order? And Soul's insistence on saving Osha and being a part of Osha's life and her being the Padawan, there seemed to be a little bit of an axe to grind as far as what Soul caused on uh, on Brendock and and everything that occurred there, so it, it it shed some some definitive light on what was going on there. So I thought that was a that was a good piece to get that to get that answer. But Mark, I wanted to ask you, like in in terms of Indara, like what did you see from her? What what interested you about finally getting a little bit more of a read on her? And honestly, kind of what she did at the end there was uh, was a little rough because it's tough. It's tough for me to watch you, you know, preaching all of this. You know, you you gotta keep it, you gotta mm-hmm. keep it a certain way. You gotta be a certain way. But then when it's time to be really accountable for something for the mistake that was made, and it seems like the same thing that we've been seeing with Vernestra throughout the season, you do the same thing. You're in the cover up portion of of the whole proceeding. So give me your thoughts on Idar. Yeah, in terms of like sheer shock factor in that character doing that, it was almost like watching Mark Wahlberg at the end of The Departed. Um, like I was just like so not ready for her yeah, to just good off call. everybody um, because it just didn't seem like it was going to match up with uh, what we'd seen from her character so far. But I think in a way, like part again, part of what I've loved about this is how much it plays back into everything that's mm-hmm. already happened and characterizes things like um, – like every character, except for, I mean, I think you can actually argue so a little bit, maybe not as much, but like, I think every character you've seen the guilt before they, mm-hmm. they, they die. They're like, you know, they're showing like they're acting differently. Um, I, I think with her in this scene, again, like it talks about everything at the, cause to me, she's like an analog for just like yeah. the Jedi way, because that's what she shows and is embodying. But then exactly like we're talking about, she's been doing and saying most of the right things throughout this. And then at the end, it's like, okay, well, we take care of our own exactly. type business. And it's like, well, that's the problem because if somebody does this, like, no, they you have to – if you want to have like a legitimate order that is respectable and, and doesn't commit atrocities, well, you can't have something like what Soul did. Like that can't happen. And instead it's like, well, we're going to cover it up. Jedi Council is never going to find out about it. And even if they did, they'd be on our side. So – you know um that i think to me that like was very much the hammering home point like that was like the i don't want to say i like mouth dropped when that happened i was like oh wow like you know this is like that's 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 how it is that's the jedi man and it was uh yeah she was was very quick to to really just be pointing at everybody for all their issues but then when it came really time to do something about something important and significant that happened man she it was such it was such cop stuff. It was really cop yeah. stuff. That was insane. I was watching an episode of The Wire. <laughs> I mean, that's soul as well. Yeah. Like that's no, thing as well. I saw I saw people on Twitter today saying, Well, Mother NSA shouldn't have turned into scary smoke. And I'm like, Do you hear yourself? Do you hear what you sound like? No, uh, shouldn't have done it. <laughs> My God. Although I will say, if in the real world that someone turned into force. scary smoke, I'd be okay with facing any force. I'm so, like, I, in the real world, I'd be like, if, if, I, if I was on the street and saw someone with scary force, like, open fire. I don't know. Jesus, what are you doing? 
But yeah. Yeah, and ex- I mean, going off that too, like on one hand, I get it because they're technically a clone of one another, but like Soul seeing May and thinking she was Ocean mm-hmm. was kind of wild. I was like, yeah. Bro. But like, I mean, exactly, because then it speaks again. Okay, mm-hmm. is your emotional impact really that strong with this kid if you don't mm-hmm. recognize that it's actually her? Like, and it speaks to that. And it's ah, that was. That was so fr- – that's, like, literally uh, – to me, that's almost the – I mean, obviously, Anakin is in his own class. But to me, that's, like, the most frustrating thing we've ever seen a Jedi do on screen is, like, that's just, like, so clearly – and, again, like, we, we talk about this in terms of them just having no understanding whatsoever of what this coven is and just having assumptions yeah. Yeah. because they're not them. Yeah. Like, we're like, well, they have to be this. When in reality, this coven is – well, they might – like, clearly, I think there's some – um there's some weirdness about you know how everything happened with with May and Osha coming about and what their purpose might be, but I think it's very clear like they came from a pretty loving place and they were yeah. going to let Osha make her own decision. Like that shows a lot more than the Jedi have in terms of being able to do that. And those, yeah. it's just I, very. Yeah. I, and I think that the decision with Soul that really got to me was his decision to just save Osha. Like that's Bye. crazy. I mean. To- I very rarely get to start sentences with as a, as a twin that like really hurt me in a, my soul. Um, like yeah. I just can't imagine, like, I don't know how I would deal with the knowledge that someone saved me and let my twin brother die. That would just be like the worst thing that's, that would actually be worse than letting me die. And honestly to me, like, I was like, not that just that's such a betrayal of everything and uh, you can say like he couldn't hold both of them up but like the fact that he makes a decision that he's like i'm going to save the one that likes me and wants to be a jedi Mm. like that Mm. is horrible (laughs) like that in my opinion is i feel bad that's dark side stuff man that i think is the worst thing he does in the episode because that is purely like there is no like rationalization about safety it's like he is just saving the one that he can train it's for purely his selfish purposes and it's like man and then to lie to her like god i if the like the person was my father figure lied to me about killing yeah. man if if someone was like yeah man michael he my twin brother if you know he he burned the whole place up and there's nothing to do to save him and then i found out he killed michael god damn it i think the great thing about that is so in the last episode we see osha getting seduced by kamir and kind of getting close to embracing the dark side and stuff like that without knowing this Mm -hmm. without knowing any of this so yeah it's pretty clear that she's probably gonna find out and what and honestly would i feel upset or feel like that she wasn't justified in whatever decision that she makes from this no i mean this is this is absolutely horrible and this is what this is this is what i'm trying to say as far as Star Wars as a whole entire thing. It is perfect that this show kind of just wrecks the idea of what all of this is. And I think this is what upsets people yeah. mm-hmm. who are watching the show and saying, well, this is not like this and this is not like this. And, you know, using other small points of, well, you can't have an explosion in space. How do the Jedi not notice somebody that's there and stuff like that? And so who's on the dark side or whatever. And I think the core of all of this is, is that the idea of who is good and who is evil, it could be anybody. It doesn't matter what the institution is. Mm-hmm. So in this case, as we see, all of these all of these Jedi in this episode, to a degree, are somewhat corrupted and have been somewhat corrupted. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the that is the fun part when you analyze the series to the points that that Mark was making earlier as far as like why you enjoy it so much and enjoy the storytelling is because we've, we've been taught to think that star Wars is one thing. And the fact that they're showing us that there's nuance, there's gray areas to everybody. And that's how, that's honestly how it should be because human beings are that way. And I think that's, I think that's the great part of what we, uh, what we've been seeing. But um, Lee, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you about, yes, Anasea and Coral, and kind of what we saw from them in this episode, because the Coven starts to really doubt Anasea's leadership, because she's going to turn uh, turn over Osha to the Jedi, 
and Coral's kind of on her own thing. She, you know, she kind of, she's going to fight. She's, she's going to be willing to defend the coven at all costs. What did you think of these dueling uh, leadership issues between, between the couple in this episode? First of all, I don't think I've ever seen, I don't think, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be the person that's like, I've never seen this on screen before. And then people are like, bah, 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 and I look stupid. I don't think I've ever seen a mother say to a young girl, uh, mm. get mad mm-hmm. like that before. Yeah. On screen or in life, honestly. Uh, so that was really cool. Even though I don't really think I agree with <laughs> Coral at the time. Um, I was like, oh, cool. Uh, um yeah I, I it's devastating that these characters well coral might still be alive that these characters are dead because they're some of the most fascinating characters mm-hmm. in star wars ever i think i want to listen to their thoughts on the thread mm-hmm. and the force all day um yeah i don't know it's hard to even talk about them as yeah they're all I, I, unfortunately like it all went up in smoke <laughs> for them what yeah yeah their so relationship and you see it in three it's just it, it's a very it, it's clear that there's a there's a definite love and care mm-hmm. but there's just a there's an opposing idea of what makes sense as coral's kind of like more of the general type mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna fight this out yeah. and nsa is kind of more of the feel it out type like mm-hmm. i'll defend us if that's what it comes down to but also there's more to this than just fighting. This is more about teaching. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. what it feels like NSA has been setting yeah, out to do. So it's unfortunate that she listens to Osha and she listens to her thoughts yeah. and her feelings. It's right. She it, it, exactly. And and I appreciated that from a, from a parental from a parental standpoint. But then now when you look at it. You could make the argument that Osha was corrupted by the Jedi. And it's just like, God damn. Uh, but at the same yeah, time. Oh, very sorry, much. And it's. Well, I I noted something when I was rewatching today um, that the, the mother's sort of favor the twin with the opposing. Not, uh, not ideology, but like may, may I think is more like mm-hmm. Anasea. She's more feminine. Um, she has this innate talent and yet Coral is the one that's like, you're my girl, I'm training you. And Coral Mm -hmm. is harder on Osha who goes to Anasaya more for guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's totally fair. A little. Yeah, totally fair. Uh, Jake, what did you, what did you see out of the company? I was just going to say that like, that obviously there is, you know, mistakes made by the Jedi, but I also don't want to just... I don't want to pretend like Osha was, you know, if they if the Jedi were just like to leave and, you know, Osha were to be, you know, go through a ritual. Like, that's not what she wants either. So, like, ultimately, like, it's not like she's she's also living in kind of a oppressive religious regime that she doesn't really like. So it's like it is kind of the one thing. I don't want to make excuses for the Jedi, but I think that it's not like she was living a peaceful life that she was super happy with. And then the Jedi came and screwed up. It's like, no, she clearly didn't want to be doing this. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like. I mean, that's why that's I think that point. the the show, while it's obviously much more sympathetic to the Coven, I don't think that the show was like, yep, the Coven was right. I think the kind of general vibe is like any sort of order that's like, we're going to decide your life from you when you're a child. Like, yeah, that's like this that. is destiny and all that stuff. She, mm-hmm. she mm-hmm. wants individuality, mm-hmm. right? Like, that's the thing mm-hmm. she wants. She's like, I'm not my sister. Mm-hmm. I want to see other kids. I want to be myself if you don't know who I am. So if that's her goal, then she just went yeah. like out of Frank and the fire, basically. Because she exactly. just left one for another. Yeah. Yeah, I think so much of it, too, was like in kind of showcasing, especially to me in looking at particularly Soul and Anasea in this episode. I think to me it was a lot of, um, again, and something that we've seen throughout this, this series is like how much – uh, the adults are influencing what light and dark is and what good and bad is. And I think Kamir, his monologue talking about how you would call me Sith, but really I just use the force. Like I just, there is like, essentially there is no good and bad. There's just the force. And then there's people who use it and can wield it. And I think it, again, it just speaks so much to like 
I think Jake made a great point in saying like, you know, we don't entirely know what the coven was going to do, but I think the point with OSHA is like, she just wants to have decisions. She wants to be able to, to find out what she wants to do. She's a kid with, with dreams. And again, like we talked about with Torben, like, I think you see a kid who was probably in that same position, what, like six or seven years before the spot where he's at and he's disillusioned already is like a 17, 18 year old kid, which is like, that sucks, bro. But then like you look at this whole thing and it's like everything is being influenced by these people who are older than you, who have started pushing you in a direction, whether by telling you to do it or you rebelling against that. Um, and I think, again, it speaks to like there isn't real decision making there. It's just you are forced into being in a certain way. And um, yeah, just kind of seeing the fallout and how that impacts everything that it's I mean, that's the story of Star Wars, how kind of your father or mother is somebody who is going to influence yeah. what you do for the next I, 25 to 30 years. I'm glad you brought um, that up so because I remember really when I, I heard an anecdote um, about when, um, you know, George Lucas was selling uh, Lucasfilm that, um, you know, Kathleen Kennedy asked him like why he made, what was going why he made Star Wars. And he's like, Oh, it was Joseph Campbell. You know, it was uh, the, 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 he was going like, doing like a lot of heady reasons. And, mm-hmm. You know, uh, but Kathy Kennedy was like, okay, but what was going on in your life? And he was like, well, I wanted to, you know, make movies and do, but my dad wanted me to work at his store or whatever. And it's like, yeah, because what the heart of Star Wars is, is how are you defined by your, what came before you, you know? And because either you're in opposition to it or you repeat it. And I think that like, that's what's kind of frustrating when people act like this is the biggest departure in the world where it's like, this is the same fucking theme. It's good versus evil. It's about power. And it's about, are you defined by where you come from? Like that, that is like the most fundamental thing about Star Wars that every character basically has in common is, are you defined by where you come from? And I think that this show is giving a very interesting reading on that because since it's not tied to characters we already know like all the other sagas are it's allowed to play with different things it's not as simple as just are you your father or are you your grandfather if you know pal if we're in a timeline where palpatine has sex um but like (laughs) are you you know your sister are you like your the plan you came from are like these questions i think are so fundamental to like living life that i'm glad that they're also being tackled because that that is always the thing that resonated me with in Star Wars. As I talked to you before, I think like the rules about like there only needs to be two Sith, this and the other. That is like my least favorite thing about Star Wars. The thing that I'm most fascinated by is like, are you even if you don't know your father is a Sith Lord, are you defined by him even if you're growing up on a backwater planet? That is a fascinating question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a lot there's a lot to take from what this series has brought us, and there's a lot to think about spinning forward into what this finale is going to be. I think one of the, and I want I don't want to say it's it's necessarily a problem, but I think something that this the show will have to juggle is the fact that this was a flashback and and we get nothing from the previous episode mm-hmm. where we had a lot of momentum building up with Kamir and Osha and that relationship and where it goes and stuff like that. Now this feels we felt like this. Uh, me and Jacob have been talking about over the past couple of weeks that this feels like a multiple season show. Mm-hmm. So now as we get into the finale, what is that going to look like? And there's a lot to there's kind of a lot to unpack and there's a lot to go to. I feel like even the idea that we learned that May and Osha aren't twins. They're two of the same mm-hmm. person. To be clear, that's not the case with me and my twin brother. <laughs> thank you for that information jake i appreciate you <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes like bringing that idea into to episode eight we still don't know who kamir's master is we i'm curious to find that out osha's trying on sith helmets and stuff so what what's going to happen with her and then what is left of soul at this point after he bears his soul literally to me mm. and what that means for the episode. There's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack and discuss. Uh, Leah, you look like you had something you wanted uh, to, to talk about there. <laughs> I have a dumb joke well, to make if, if there's an opening. All of it. And I, God, I, God, oh, I hope Jesus this episode Christ. isn't yeah, it doesn't, yeah. long. What I happened really to 42 and a half minutes? Oh, uh, yeah. What did we, we've strayed from God's light. But the joke I was going to make is what I should have, a joke I should have made like Beautiful. three episodes ago when Osha was still on Soul Side is that I should have said, as the great Brandon Flowers once said, I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. But I should have made that three episodes ago. Sorry about that. 
<laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Mark, what what in the finale are you most interested in seeing uh, told as far as the story is concerned? Yeah, um, I think kind of like you just hit on uh, figuring out who Kamir's master is something I'm so interested by because what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, because we aren't mm. going to have a connection to that character most likely, which is what's really exciting about it. Um, but then on top of that too, I think what I was most interested to find out about in this episode, because I wasn't, I mean, I think we eventually knew it was going to be a flashback, but um, I was like, I really just want to know what the hell is going to go on with Venestra. Cause that is, that's the thing all, all story where I've been like, ah, I, I yes. feel like there's definitely a lot more there. Her connection is very murky to me. Um, I want to know more, but also like as sure. a quick aside to, um, I don't know, like if you guys ever played Star Wars, the old, old Republic's just MMO online. Um, but one of the things I've always found interesting about the Acolyte since it got announced, like there was a storyline that came out for the old Republic that mm -hmm. was essentially like very similar to this. Um, and I've always wondered how much they've like tied into it because I think this this was almost like probably seven or eight years ago, but it was supposed to be twin brothers who are raised by uh, an honestly evil figure and they split sides. And it's just like very interesting. So the way that it's played out, but I, cause I just, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. That, I mean, I, I mean, I think it. Leslie Hedlund said um, it's not based on anything specifically, but she also seems to be deep in the, uh, you yeah. know, legends and all these things. So um, yeah. No, very intriguing stuff. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think one of the, I know for me, now that we know the issue with soul and we got a different look into who he is, um, him having to face OSHA with this information yeah. is, is like headline front and center for me in this next episode and what that will mean for OSHA as she was so pushed to kind of explore what the dark side is and what it might be for her mm -hmm. and whether that pushes her or whether she chooses another way and relents. That's, you know, that that's always up in the air to see. So I'm kind of fascinated to see that, but, but Jake, what, what do you think about uh, what interests you the most about what's to come here? Yeah. I, I I'm, hopeful that they get a second season just because i actually don't think that they can resolve everything in this last episode. no no not um, at all i feel like cliffhangers coming yeah I but like. i want there's a couple things i need them to resolve i need them to resolve um you know i did that the conversation you're describing with soul and osha uh some of them needs to happen yes that revelation has to happen i think the revelation of how vernestra relates to all of this um you know as i've joked before there's no i i just have i I would be very surprised if Leslie Headland asked her partner to go for four hours of green makeup to have her character not be uh, important. That would be really fucked up if she did that. Um, <laughs> and so I think that there's going to be something there. Like, those are the two big things. And, like, I'm fine with, like, Osha's ultimate fate and May's ultimate fate obviously still being up in the air. But, like, mm -hmm. they need to have these – these revelations need to come to light to the correct people. Um, because as we discussed, like, the kind of – the issue I've had with both the flashback episodes as – the way they're constructed is that since they are just flashback episodes with no like bookends or whatever we don't really we don't experience it as characters learning this information and so like it's one thing for us to know what happened it's actually just much more important for the story though that ocean knows like it actually doesn't mean anything that we know it like she needs to know it yes absolutely i yeah i think that all of that is very important i think what what uh what was said about vernestra I think also is yeah such a huge part because where where does she stand? Like, is she just hiding stuff from the Senate? Is there a dark side thing at play with her? Because obviously, obviously, she frames Soul, or and and that's kind of like a a sweet bit of karma for Soul for having been protected previously from something terrible that he did, and in this case, he's now being framed for it. What does that mean for Soul? But yeah, Vernestra, that's a fascinating part to to look at too as as we get to this finale. But Leah, I wanted to get your get your thoughts. Like, what's one thing that you're yeah. like, huh, I really need this in this episode? How do you kill ah! a Jedi without a weapon? <laughs> that's the question, right? And is it 
that you turn him? Like, is the answer going to be that Soul joins oh them and they God, become a merry little dark side family? Idea. I don't know. Or, or does she just I, would also be satisfying at this point? You if know, Osha killed him. Huh. Honestly, I, 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 li- so I, I like was... just before you continue. I like the idea of Soul turning to the dark side. Yeah, because this tortured figure at this point, death would be too easy. Yeah. And it's killing his ideology. And he's the, he's the only one that hasn't exiled himself from this little crew. He is one of the more culpable, and he's the only one that's stuck with the Jedi and still believes, like, truly believes that he did the right thing. Yeah. Oh, um, so, and it could happen. I did, mm-hmm. while we were talking earlier, mm-hmm. I did think one kinder read, mm-hmm. if we mm-hmm. want to give Indara a bone, for her saying to or just instructing him to lie to Osha is maybe she was like, no, 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 no. You're not giving yourself up to the council. The thing you is, I actually would say train her. that in terms you of know? a cost benefit, I'm not of like her. how, like in terms of how negatively it would affect her and the Jedi, it is actually the way that the Jedi order is set up. It actually is the right decision for her to cover it up, which I think is the whole problem. Like it actually, it's completely rational for her to cover it up. It, it benefits no one yeah, for exactly. her to like, I mean, that's the whole parallel to like police and other organizations. She's on such like a, I mean, we've said it. She's on such mm-hmm. a downward spiral. Cause she's so good with mm-hmm. May when she's asking mm-hmm. questions about the Ascension. She asks exactly mm-hmm. the right questions with exactly the right tone is like not even when she even when may misquotes mm-hmm. her mother and makes it seem a little bit spooky um you know dar's like oh okay great not my problem you're not hurting me it's good and then she just makes the worst of all choices uh finale yes uh i think i agree that the osha and soul confrontation is the most important thing the vernestra and the the senate potentially auditing the jedi that feels like season two. Yeah. I feel fairly confident that they're going to get. Because Leslie keeps bringing it up in And the numbers, and from what I've heard, really good at obviously they make up shit all the time. Um, but, like, I think the numbers are doing pretty well. I think it's definitely doing better than, like, you know, I think it's doing better than Ahsoka, honestly. And I really think that, like, I just think that the people who are against it are, like, a my, you can, I, it feels like they're a minority. Like, whereas, like, it actually does feel like a lot of people in the internet do hate The Last Jedi. It only, it feels like it's really a pretty small amount of people who really hate the show. Like, I haven't heard really, I haven't even heard a norm, like, normies in my life have not criticized the show, you know? Yeah. No, the yeah. worst would be that they yeah, heard right, it yeah. was bad, so they haven't watched, you know, it's. Yeah, no, exactly. I will say point like I I despise the Last Jedi and I love the show, so it's been <laughs> it's it's worked out okay. And people despise yeah. the Last Jedi for like fifteen yeah. different like my, reasons. I, I, so I'm in a rock and hard place because I love the Last Jedi, but my brothers hate it. But like they don't hate it because there's women in it. They hate it because like they don't think that they don't like that it's makes jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but that's the thing. That also gets to the thing that you were talking about earlier, Anthony, where people know there's some people that are like, you know, they know it's bad to say I hate it because of women or because of people of color. But they're like, no, it's the, with the fire else. in yeah. space. That's the problem that I had. Yeah. It people just bugs me and I just yeah. don't know why. <laughs> to me, it's just not to get on a whole rant, but it's bringing the back was so today. fucking ridiculous. No, nah, but yeah, uh, I feel like I feel like Mark. That's just a general like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, I, got to, I got to get that Rise of Skywalker off my chest as I a fan. I respect it. it. I respect yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> I have to. Because that was terrible. It was insane. Oh, I remember I was watching in the theater and I'm like, okay, my bad. Last year I was. And I was in the theater. I was in the fucking Cena Bistro in Sarasota, Florida. I was drinking a fucking like. Rough. Shirley Temple with whiskey in it because that's what you do there. And I'm like, this is delicious. And every moment I'm like, surely they. It, they didn't let angry redditors write the script surely they didn't they didn't they didn't oh they did oh i, I guess they did that's sure interesting <laughs> that they did that oh, i remember it so well mm-hmm. i the social reactions mm-hmm. to that movie came out about an hour after mm. i exited a press screening oh, of cats, cats. <laughs> i had a meltdown oh, no. in the street I had, I truly, I was like, supposed to meet my friend for, for like Christmas drinks before we both went home. 
And I tr- truly was just like standing in the street going, I can't go in there. I can't go in there. I think art might be dead. I don't know what to think anymore. <laughs> And, that exactly. was December 20- and now, and now we have fucking so Zoomers saying right. that no one knows who J.J. Abrams is. I know exactly who he is. He's the person who brought Palpatine back. That's and and Chapel Rowan's interesting plan. Heard. Okay. Oh my god. I'm just, I'm just getting beat. I'm just getting grievances off. By the way, I texted. <laughs> I texted my brother. I said, <laughs> wanted to let you know that I make it clear on oh, this man. week's Act Light Pod that I'd be really mad if someone let you fall off a bridge in order to save me and then lied about it. And he just responds, "This is how. This is the way he is. Different from me. Just thank you and likewise." <laughs> 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 that's, great. that's great oh the rise of skywalker you know what's funny about that movie i didn't see it when it was in theaters because everybody just shit canned it yeah. and killed it and i was just like all right i'll just wait my problem I'm- was i saw it like two weeks after it came out because my family wanted to see it and i was gonna see it with them at the cedar bistro in sarasota yeah. florida and uh like it was like December 29th. And so like, there were like a week and a half where I'm like, I know this movie isn't good, but I already, we already going to go Damn. anyway. Um, that's tough, man. Yeah. yeah it was a, it was a lot. Star Wars has definitely had very, uh, yeah. their misses over the yeah. years. And, um, I don't feel like the acolyte is one of those misses. No, not Again, I, 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 I love the ambition of this show. I love that they're willing to do different things and tell different stories. And I hope the finale is no different. So it should be really fascinating to see. want to thank our guests for joining us. Uh, both Leah and Mark appreciate y'all for stopping by. Uh, Mark, where can we follow you and find your work, sir? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at MG underscore Schindler. Uh, still kind of figuring out what's next work-wise, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, always doing all things covering women's basketball. Um, very excited to be on here. Long thank you for the support, man. We, caller, I've so seen you in the mentions for a long time. And I, AC was like, hey, I would chat to Mark. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, I know that guy. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, appreciate you definitely. Oh, and, yeah. um, you know, big fan of your work, too. I, 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 think, I think it's something to be said. Thank and I think it's important that we have somebody so passionate about the W. And just to be able to. Because now, like, every time that. As somebody who has a couple of kids and who says, like, after the NBA season, like, I'm going to just take a break from basketball, like, every so often because of how everybody talks about Asia Wilson and how great the, the aces are. Got to check them out at least a couple of times. And obviously, the Liberty are really good. I got to go to Liberty game this year. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The... Yeah. Worth yeah. it. Much more. Yeah, so so we got to go to a Liberty game. Actually, you're busy. Yeah, you know what? We, we, we got to go to a Liberty I mean, game. We can. We can yeah. do it. Leah, you want to go to a Liberty game? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay, no, we got to gotta have like a fucking... Right. I love going to basketball yeah. games. And also, Look at you, know, Mark. Look at you, Mark, doing... Yeah. doing have you seen, yeah, uh, you seen the, the Liberty's mascot, yes. Ellie? Look at me her? influencing. She is an elephant who, like, gets down. Oh, She's great. The Ellie. Anyway. Yeah. Love her. <laughs> Hell yeah. But yes. For anyone who's like, not aware of Ellie, my friends, uh, my friend at, over at Anscape did a phenomenal feature on Ellie. That is it's just, so funny. Like, I saw the clip. I think it was uh, they were like going through the insane. tunnel, she's and Sabrina Onescu was coming up, and Ellie was posing, and she's like, "Oh wait, well, I'll, I'll wait for Ellie." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yes, Mark. Yeah, once again, yeah. like the support is much appreciated, and happy to have you on. You get your perspective. Uh, this is a, this is the first time, and not the last time. So uh, so happy to happy to have you come through. And Leah, uh, of course, as always, thank you for joining us once again. Uh, let us know where we can as follow always. you and, and what you're writing, what you're, what you're cooking up. Oh, God. And not, nothing too exciting right now. But you can follow me at uh, Leah Marilla, where every day I threaten to just become mm-hmm. a Walking Dead Stan account because I've got nothing I saw, better I, to do. I was, I was, um, you, you were making me very dangerously anymore. close to going back for Rick and Michonne. Are you dangerously close? I should watch it? Okay. You're like, you by the way, watch, Leah, you're you like two watch tweets it. away you from getting me to live. interview for, you, with a vampire, so c- congratulations. I need to get into it. <laughs> Interview the Vampire, also a great show. Um, Fun fact. Yeah, uh, follow me at Leah Marilla. Um, I will, I'll, I'll post our I will say what's I in my podcast queue next there, is uh, you um, on but, the Unauthorized uh, Book Pod about Jingle ooh. All the Way. 
Because I, I don't, I've, I'll be honest with you, I only have listened to your appearances and David Sims' appearances, which I should listen to more of them, but you're great on it, and I want to hear you talk about the novelization right. of Jingle All the Way. It genuinely, so they made me read that book that as punishment episode. for making them read uh, <laughs> the Little Mermaid live action novelization. Wonderful. And I'm so excited. We loved Jingle All the Way. We loved the Jingle All the Way. That's book. great. That's it great. It's so. really good. Please listen to that. Wait, yeah. like the the Arnold movie has a book? Yep. Yeah. So my friend, my friend Hannah and her friend Andrew have a podcast where they read um, authorized novelizations yeah. of yeah. films. Yeah. And yeah. just talk about that. It's yeah. The Little Mermaid one that was great. I remember I, the first one I listened to was David them. Sims on for Species, which was great because that's fucking crazy. <laughs> Yeah, like it's crazy, and like I think it's, it's from like the first person of the species. <laughs> yeah, because oh god, cause, like who would pick this up? I mean, we know. I was thinking, like, you know what? I would love to sit down. <laughs> well, yeah, the answer to this question, I know we're not. This is not a good thing, but the answer is Quentin Tarantino. That's the. I mean, that's the answer to the question of who's going to read a novelization or anything. <laughs> No, oh, well, but like I remember, I once heard him on a podcast. Good, you know, the novelization of the '80s movie Eyewitness is really good, and I'm like, you really had no <laughs> friends at all, man. Thank oh man, God, yes, man. one wonderful stuff, and yes, thank you, Leah, right. once again. Um, ho- hoping to be hearing some stuff from you on Deadpool and Wolverine, and see, see what you got popping with that. Because like, we're not too far away; oh. we're getting close. Oh yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, we're we're getting real close. Oh Good my mind. goodness! I, 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 I can't wait. Gonna We're gonna be, gonna be gearing up for that on this pod soon. But <laughs> Jay Christie, where can we follow you, sir? Follow me at the Jay Christie on Twitter. Uh, my other podcast, Love It First Psych. Me and Andrew Barrett talking about Psych. And then follow me on TikTok. I started a series on TikTok where I'm going through what I consider the most important tweets of all time because I realized on our mailbag pod that I have an unhealthy recollection of tweets, and I need to talk about them. I like I have thoughts about tweets from 2013, and I need to get them off my chest. And so, uh, follow me on at it's at the J Christie on TikTok. There you have go. You, uh, about what the the whole thing? No, have you talked about it's, Miami it's Vice less yet? about like Twitter drama. It's it, but also <laughs> it's it's oh, it's about like God, historical God. tweets. So maybe in like a year yeah. I'll do that. But wow, man, it's I mean it's it getting, is for it's those getting who don't close know, to there's a woman there, who like made it's, a tweet basically it's, it's criticizing stopped. a guy for showing I think his girlfriend Miami Vice because like. It's a too bro of a movie, I guess, is I think the way the impetus was. And she's. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the girlfriend asked, show me your favorite movie. And he showed to. her Miami Vice. <laughs> and then this random person was like, this is too straight bro of a movie. And has been posting through it so much that she ended up like looking up this dude's LinkedIn, other people she's been doxing. She's like a. And she apparently is like a former like museum art curator. Like, I just. It is. And it got to the point where the IFC Center in New York is doing a two-night showing of Miami Vice's weekend because so many people have gotten into this drama. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's that's and the, tremendous. The important thing about this is yeah. the Miami yeah. Vice movie fucking rules, and she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know what's funny when it comes when it comes to Twitter these days, like when it comes to tweets, yeah. I just go into anybody who posts the deleted tweets thread oh. if you ever go in any of those threads you will be laughing in a rabbit hole for endless minutes because that's the only thing these days that like really really just makes me laugh mm. we did it on the subscriber mailbag and i just lost my mind at a yeah. couple of these so if you're interested in that that's cool and then as far as i'm concerned you can follow me on twitter at anthony canton underscore three follow the show at mc university pod on all platforms mention the patreon we got some good stuff coming up with that what else what else the- happened this week ac though what, what, what? oh yes oh my gosh and see this is part of the reason why did you why, why did you why forget? did i forget because the hashtag is washed agenda folks as we have merch washed agenda you can get your shirts your hoodies your hats your tank tops you can get all those things on t public um actually jake you know what in the episode description just put the link towards that yep. boy i got it yeah coming my way which felt appropriate yeah i'm getting a shirt i'm getting a tank top we are we are rolling I'm, i might have to get the hat too so if you know I think the, over the last couple of years, as I said yesterday, um, this this hashtag has been a great part mm-hmm. of this show mm-hmm. and a great part of my Twitter personality as I've had a lot of fun with it. And it's funny, when you look up hashtag Wash Agenda, you really only see my tweets yeah, you and people, with it. <laughs> who, people who support the show or follow mm-hmm. the show or friends of the show and things along those lines. 
So I love that um, that people have also embraced it as yeah. well. So it's been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you want to support the show and 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 grab grab some merch, go do that too. So yeah, appreciate everybody for supporting that. And and like I said, subscribe to the YouTube channel and and keep going getting those numbers up as well. So for Mark and Leah and Jake, I'm Anthony Canton the Third. This has been Marvel Cinematic University, and we will talk to you next time.